Welcome to another Drobo Photo Focus webinar. This time the subject is portraiture, and I'm real excited to have Levi Sim as my guest. I'm Kevin Ames, Director of Content for Photo Focus, as well as a commercial photographer based in Atlanta. How are you doing, Levi? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. I'm, oh, it's, I'm it's always fun. I'm so glad you're here. You're yeah. looking really dapper today. I always love the bow ties. Well, thanks. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Levi, you work out of where? I'm in Nampa, Idaho. Yeah. Uh, very Which close to where I was born, actually. I was born right. in Boise and grew up in Emmett. So we're, I'm a native Idahoan and you're a transplant, and I understand you're having a great time. I am. I am. But nobody else should move here, apparently, is, is what everybody says. Well, so. that's, that's, I've been telling people that forever. You know, you, uh, people don't, uh, they don't suntan in Idaho. They rust, you know. <laughs> Don't want them going there. It is beautiful, though. Anyway, we want to talk about portraits. And I see that you've got one all queued up for us already. So, let's, so this first photograph is a studio portrait. It is, although you could make this picture with a flashlight and a bed sheet as well. Um, during this picture, I was, uh, I was actually just doing some headshots for Sean. And we were in, in my office, in my studio, with a gray background and um you know he's just he's a striking guy and with those glasses on i had for some reason this picture of um of jacques cousteau came to my mind i don't know if you one by uh yosef karsh exactly that's the one and uh it, you know world famous explorer back when exploring was was a thing and uh just a profile picture you know simple very simple light very simple background and uh, wanted to try that with my friend Sean here, and so it's striking, and it's really easy. Now, where yeah. you said a flashlight and a bed sheet? Come on. Yeah, no, seriously, because all you need to do is create a soft light that that is a larger light, and by shining a flashlight through a, a white bed sheet or or even a pillowcase, it it takes that little tiny flashlight. And shines it through the big sheet or the or the or the pillowcase or a tablecloth or a oh you know what's really good is like those those disposable vinyl tablecloths they make them that are white right and they're super they're super thin and you could just hold that up and shine a flashlight into it and it enlarges the size of that flashlight and uh, it spreads the light that, out it, it makes the light, light source bigger it it so it's softer exactly it makes it soft and it it makes and, and by soft, we mean that, that it doesn't have these hard, definite transitions between the bright side of his face. Like, look at his forehead right here. Mm -hmm. we, can say, we can see how bright that is right on the left side of his forehead, of, of, of the picture, rather. And then over here, we can see that it's darker. But we can't say that this exact spot is where it becomes dark because there's this, there's this blending transition across yeah, here. That and that's, shadow edge transition. Exactly, and that's what the soft light gives us. And right. um, for people that want to know more about the quality of light and their properties, the last webinar we did for Drobo was on understanding light, and all of okay. these topics are covered. So we'll just recommend people go over there for a, a, a more okay. in-depth. I think this is a great review, though, Levi. You bet. So the thing that makes this picture work well is, or, or the thing that makes it easy to make this picture is just understanding that contrast comes from, from simply being closer to the light. And so I didn't change anything about my setup from, from doing a headshot with Sean. All I did was have him step a lot closer to the light. In fact, the, the light is actually in the corner of this photograph originally, and I, and I just used the erase tool to, to remove it. Um, and you so do just that by too, doing, huh? I do, absolutely. <laughs> That's what corners are for. They're for putting lights in. That's um, right. And and so Sean just scooted closer to the light, and you don't have to change anything except your um, your aperture. Make it a make it a smaller aperture, which darkens the whole picture. Right, because you're compensating the for light, the brightness of the light. Exactly, because cool. he's closer to the light. There's there's more light falling on him at the same time, and so you need a smaller aperture. But it darkens the rest of the photograph. Yep. Let's and, go to uh, the next one. Just makes it easy. Yeah. Oh, I like this, this. Yeah, this is a fun one. This is our friend Greg from, uh, he, he um, what's the word? 
he sells Topaz software at all the shows. So you guys might recognize sure. him. Sure. Yeah. And uh, he and I were were at a at a Scott Kelby presentation in, I think it was Austin, Texas, and uh, there was this this interesting brick wall there, and this picture is just made with with the available light in the room, and uh, there's these big Florida ceiling windows off to his you know off to camera right here, and they're shining the sun is shining directly in those windows, and mm-hmm. if you look closely in his eyeballs. You can you can see that that reflection right. on the floor and in the window up there. Right. Well, but he's not he's not sitting in that direct sunlight. He's sitting just behind it. I'm standing in the direct sunlight. Gotcha. That that light is just reflecting off the floor and coming in off that off the sidewalk outside and off uh, just coming in a scance from the window and illuminating him. Well, it's truly stunning. We've got a bunch of questions from your Facebook page. And okay. I wanted to ask one of them that really I think is a good beginning is for someone starting out, what equipment would you recommend for indoor studio or outdoor shots? And what would the budget look like? I mean, we've already talked about pillowcases, horribly expensive. What about a dollar ninety nine <laughs> from uh, Target? Yeah, or, or beat that and go to Goodwill. <laughs> there you go. You don't, you don't need new pillowcases. Well, um, one of the things I love is you can get some really good textiles for cheap from IKEA. That's true. Yeah, yeah, and they're they're brand new, and they're they even have all kinds. Yeah, IKEA is an interesting place to go look for lighting tools. It really is. Display. Yeah, it really is. So let's look at this next picture, the one of you, and you've kind of made this really. Famous Walter Isaacson did it originally for the cover of his of I mean not Walter Isaacson but it was for the cover of Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs and was it Albert Watson that did the photograph? It, it was Albert Watson who did the who did the famous picture that's on Isaacson's book. However, Steve Jobs did this pose throughout his life. Yeah. And you've and done so a whole series of these. Do you want to talk yeah. just very briefly about how the lighting set up? This one, I think you credit by of being photographed by Roberto Valenzuela, right? Yes, he pushed the button for me. We were at a at a party at Photoshop World, and I had my my Steve Jobs portrait project set up. And uh, this one I actually shot on T Max. Oh, uh, film. Yeah, with a six by with my uh, Pentax six seven. Oh, what a great Pentax. old camera. Yeah, it was marvelous. I was an uh, RB guy myself. Yes, yes. Well, but anyway, we digress. That big wooden handle on the side, <laughs> which was just fun. Um, the setup for this picture is really simple. It's it's a it's one soft box. It happens to be a speed light here, and it's it's a round soft box as well. It can be a soft box or a beauty dish. Um, something about thirty inches, twenty six to to thirty six inches is is a really nice size to use. You can see in my eyeball that this one's actually an octagon, and you just position it to the to the side of your subject, a little in front of them, so that it's shining in both eyes, and um, and kind of casting this this shadow of the nose off to the toward the bottom right, like that. It's super and soft then, Rembrandt light. Yeah, well, yeah. It's it it should be it should be loop, I think, because because you definitely want to have that light in the in both eyes. Right. Um, but yeah, like a, a loop Rembrandt kind of setup, and you can look up what those mean. We could we we've got articles on PhotoFocus about that too. Um, and then I, I shined a. Um, speaking of bed sheets, I think I had a bed sheet hanging up behind us with another speed light shining into it to make a a white backdrop, and then used a little Lightroom magic to to make sure it was all white in the back. Oh, but we didn't finish the last question. The um, what right the, the studio one, setup. So the, the reason I, well, the reason I wanted you to get into this one is because this kind of answers the question gear wise. You have two speed lights, yeah. a bed sheet and a soft box. Right. But even even cheaper than that, uh, you, you need a five in one reflector and you can make a living uh, for for an outdoor. Well, for outdoors and indoors. Um, what size? You could use a, I, I like a 40 by 60. I like the ovals. The round one is is typical. You know, people typically get about a 40 inch circle, but whenever if if someone is helping you hold that, they end up covering half of it with their body <laughs> when right. they try to hold it, and so you lose the power. and And you're typically going to use it 
not as a reflector, but as a scrim, as a diffuser, with light shining through it rather than reflecting off of it. And so get a get a nice big oval shaped diffuser, and that will give you a lot more options when you're creating light. Very good, very good. Now they also wanted to know budget. Yeah, so like that that reflector, if you paid fifty bucks for a forty by sixty, that would be a an expensive one. Right. So you can get them on Amazon. B and H has some excellent options. Um, I think their their impact brand, their in house impact brand. That's has the, the five in one, and they're yeah. really good. I've used those, right. and often they come with a stand, which is handy. Uh, it's only handy if you sandbag it. You can't you can't do anything with a with a reflector that's not sandbagged for sure. Um, well, unless you've got somebody to hold the light stand for you. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, that's always it. a good thing. It is. So, what are some of the what one of the recurring themes in the questions are? How do you build rapport? with a client in a short amount of time uh, when you're doing a portrait. And here you've got, what, seven clients that you've yeah. got to get going all in, all in one direction quickly? Because kids right. have no attention span at all. Yeah, no, it's, it's got to, you've got to have some rapport with folks. Um, and so just talking, just, just exploring things with people. Now, a mistake I think many photographers make, especially with kids, is playing 20 questions. Like you get a kid in front of your lens and you start pounding them with questions and questions and questions. It, it, like kids get hammered with questions all the time. They're in school, wherever. People say, how old are you? What's your favorite color? What's your name? Um, are you out shopping with mom today? Just question, question, question all the time. And nobody ever gives them anything. And if you just give a little to kids, you you get a relationship with them instead of a inquisitor relationship you know right well that wouldn't work very well with a parent either if you think about it it's true and people like photographers still do that they sit there and say so how was your day um what are you doing this week but they don't give themselves to their subject either well do you want to give an example you're one of the most outgoing photographers i've ever met and you're incredibly engaging so what would you say to say the little girl in the mom's lap um well so well, the the first thing I usually do is make a group picture, um, unless I've already got some rapport with somebody in the in the pictures. I need an example for that little girl, and so we can make a group picture. It's probably not going to be the one I end up using because we don't have any great rapport yet. Um, but let's say let's say I already know the older brother here. Maybe um, maybe I photographed his sports team or something. And so I can talk with him and everybody else there sees us having a conversation and and it's good. And he's smiling. And then I show mom the picture and she says, oh, that's great. And then so now the kids see that I make great pictures and we have a good time doing it. And so that example helps everybody else feel better. So if, if I've already got rapport with one person, that's great. Um, but I'll do a, a quick group picture and then break into individuals. And now I get to spend some time with each person. Uh, making a making a picture together and building rapport individually, and then we get back together again for the group portrait. And now I've got rapport with every person in there, and I can also uh, I can call on on each person by name. Now, as it happens, when I photographed these guys, I did their their whole extended family as well. Um, you know, it's it's the right. Is it the brothers or is it the sisters? I think it's. <laughs> I think it's the the sis the the wife here. Anyway, yeah, we get the I've idea. Yeah, we get the idea. So uh, so now I've done individuals. I've done small family groups with each of these, and then we also did a large family group that's now got twenty five people in it. And I can call each of those people by name and say, "Look at me," or say, "You know, stand up a little taller, turn towards there." Is that the and- next picture, Levi? I, well, no, <laughs> that's the, but it shows the, the idea too. Yeah. It shows the idea. Um, but oh, this would be your family. I see you right in the middle there. Yeah. Um, just building, building rapport by having a, a normal conversation. I am effervescent and I'm bubbly and I talk and I, you don't have to be me to do this though. You do not have to be a gregarious outgoing person. You just have to be yourself and talk genuinely. 
that's it. You just talk genuinely. Right. And, is, uh, is that how you create an emotional reaction in a subject? Let's yeah, say you want somebody to be very excited. Do you show them excitement on your, on the, behind the camera? Yeah. Yes. Like as, as you're saying there, the, the camera looks both ways. Right. And so I can reflect, I can, I can, the things that, that somebody is saying, if I reflect those, they, they magnify. And so if I show interest in what a child is saying or what an adult is saying, it helps them feel more confident and it helps them feel better. And the whole time I'm making pictures, you know, that's why I use a tripod because I don't need to look through the viewfinder for every shot. I use a tripod every time I can because then I can step away from the black box. Yes. And I have a conversation with somebody. And if even better is, is using a, a remote release, you know, a cable release or, um, or a, a remote control. That way I don't have to touch the black box at all. My favorite right. is I've got a, I've got a, uh, a tripod head from Vanguard. That's a pistol grip, but it's not the pistol grip with the camera sitting on top of it. No, the camera sits just on top of a ball head. And then there's a, uh, it's in the other room. And then there's a, a grip that comes out from behind and it's got a trigger on it that plugs into your camera. And so you can, you can have your, your hand behind the camera triggering the button the whole time. And one of the things that makes people blink in a picture is anticipating and they can see your finger moving on top. And so if you use a remote or with this with this pistol grip, I've got um, my hand is behind the camera and they can't see when I'm firing the camera. So I, I get a lot more open eyeballs that way. There you go. We've got a question about open eyeballs. Let's go to your next image. Uh, OK. Or, or so do, you, do you have something else to say about the group? I do so this this is my own family, which is the most important pictures we can make. Right, uh, are our own people. the The way that I do this is I set up a I set up the camera on a tripod. I build a place for everybody to sit, and the whole time that I'm posing every you know positioning everybody in their family groups, um, I've got the the camera is running using the intervelocitor. Intervelocitor. Intervelometer. <laughs> the intervelometer, which is... Which I is think an intervelocitor is a dinosaur. <laughs> I think it was a Mystery Science Theater 3000 thing. Uh, and uh, and so the camera is taking a picture every second. It's not just the timer mode. Because when you press the timer, you've got 10 seconds and you have to run over there and position yourself. And then it takes maybe three pictures. Right. Uh, and of course, can... where you're sitting, it would be almost impossible to right. get, okay, now little kids stand up and I'm going to come sit down, jump on my lap and look natural. And you got to do it in three seconds. Precisely. And, and, so, and when, okay, I got to know, everybody has their eyes open. How in the world did you get that? How'd you do because, that? Because oh, okay. Every, every second I've got everybody looking somewhere. Everybody's looking at some point. And so by combining three pictures, I ended up with the, uh, the good final image. That's and, a great tip. And that's tip. what we do, whether in Photoshop or in, or in Lightroom and, or excuse me, Luminar. So yeah, that's, that's a tip on that one. And this one is just available light. Um, the sun is coming up behind these trees. So we've got a little, a little hair light on everybody. And then we've got a, a grassy field in front of us with, with aging grass. And so that grass is light colored and, and gives just enough lift to, to everybody's faces in there. Yeah, it looks great. So you didn't use any any other lighting in that at all? Nope. Nope. Just just the, the morning sun from two directions. <laughs> there you go. Well, so open sky is lighting them and the sun is light in the background. Exactly. Good. Exactly. So one of the questions that came up is how do you get the sparkle in the eyes? And I think what the person's actually asking is how do you get the catch lights? Yeah, catch lights are that are that little highlight, like right here in Jacob's eyeballs. Right. And and that's the most important thing. I don't care how open somebody's eyes are, as long as they've got some catch light in there. People naturally squint a little bit when they smile. Um, right. And that is good. It's that Duchesne smile that we're after. That that looks genuine. You and mean it's not the Pan Am smile? Not the Pan Am smile. <laughs> exactly. 
Exactly. The Pan Am yeah. smile is uh, what it was named after the flight attendants on Pan yeah. Am. And they have that really <laughs> neutral smile, but there's no life in their eyes. The Duchesne right. smile, on the other hand, is, is like Jacob here. Yeah, yeah. And it's so genuine. to get that light in their eyes, there needs to be a light reflecting from their eyes. Uh, this is often, it can often be the horizon. Like in this photo, the uh, the only light shining on their faces is coming from the horizon behind me. And you can see that it's kind of a long, skinny light. Well, what's happening is the head. light in the background is hitting the open sky. And so you're seeing the entire big sky reflected in their eyes, right? And it's so it's a, this was such a great situation. Um, you know how it is in the, in the mountains in the oh, West in the, in the summertime. You get these afternoon storms. And so there's a storm directly above us. But the sun is now setting below that cloud behind them. And the horizon behind me is open. So they've got this really directional light. It's not coming from above. It's just coming straight back into their faces. And we end up with that, that reflective catch light in their eyeballs, as well as the, the warm golden highlight from behind. Yeah, and no, so, it's, it's magic. Yeah. And you can use that, that five-in-one reflector. If you just hold that up in, some, in front of somebody's face, you're going to get a pretty good catch light. Uh, when the sun is behind them, if you shine, uh, if you if you reflect a speed light off of that reflector back into their faces, that gives a great catch light. Um, but yeah, that that is the second most important thing in a photograph. What's the first most important? That right there. It's, it's oh yeah, it's, yeah. It is it is it is expression. Every Bambi Cantrell used to say expression over perfection every time. She, I'm sure she's not the only one who said it, but. She taught me that that idea. And there's all kinds of things wrong about this photo, but there is nothing wrong with this photo. It is ready to print. There, you know, we've got we've got ultimate joy in this yeah. in my son in his face riding a horse. You know, it says everything. It's got the place, it's got horse, it's got expression, and that is the most important thing. I'm not selling this to Nike. Nike right. wants the shoes to look good. No, that this is all right. about this is all about the family and the remembrance of the moment. Absolutely. No, absolutely. it's pure joy. You're absolutely right. And if you're totally nitpicky, the power lines can be retouched out of the background. Yeah. yeah if they, if they're true. totally if they're totally ruining you. Yeah. But that that moment. Yeah. That it's, expression is the important thing. It's I absolutely like out of focus. You know, if it focused on his rear shoulder instead of his face, it doesn't matter. It the really next. doesn't. No, it's a marvelous image, Levi. Marvelous. Well, thanks. It's not going to be a 30 by 40 on my wall, but it is a 5 by 7 on the bookshelf right now. Absolutely. You can't, you can't not make this kind of picture for your client, for your for your friends and for your family. Well, somebody brings up the idea of, of they want to know what are the best colors for clothing. And mm. do you have a general rule of thumb? Oh, man. Yeah. You should always wear the clothes that you feel best in. Good point. <laughs> there's there's a there's a, a book called what's it called? Living Your Truth. Uh, this this psychologist or psychiatrist, one of the two, she's developed this whole system and she's realized that it's not just about being an autumn or a winter or a summer. You know, there's there's a lot more to it. And People, she says there's four types of people, and this type of person looks good in these kind of clothes. And she gives a whole whole idea about uh, the textures they should wear, the colors they should wear, the collars they should wear. And she's right. Like, every time I put it to the test, she's right. And and people end up feeling better when they when they wear the right thing. And so if there are clothes that you know you look good in, you should wear those. You shouldn't worry about wearing a little black dress because you're supposed to. There's nothing you're supposed to wear for a photo except for the clothes that help you feel good. And so this guy, like, he should wear this shirt. This is an appropriate shirt for him. I don't care that his button is undone. I don't care that it's not pressed. It doesn't matter. These are clothes that he looks good in right we're not yeah. doing fashion here I, you have a really good point and you have your own style and brand and i'm going to switch you back onto the screen so that people can see the levi look and this is a look that right. i've seen you wear 
since the first time I ever met you, I don't know how many years ago, you yep. always have the hat, you always have the bow tie, don't necessarily always have the jacket, but this is Levi right. on brand to the point that your logo even looks like a silhouette of you. Right. Right. So, but, I, but I always wear a brown hat. Yeah. Because when I wear a black hat, it doesn't feel like me. Right. Well, you're not <laughs> that guy in Westworld. Well. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but anyway, so shall we move on? Oh, you know, Levi, this is brought to us by Drobo. And I know that you're a Drobo user. So I can we talk for a minute? Thing. What Drobo do you have? Um, I've got a 5D, which they don't even make it. I think they're on like version 3 of the 5D right now. Is that right? Right. It's 5D3. And the 5D3. So I've got the 5D. It's an original. I, I've had it for, I don't know, six or seven years. And the the thing that I love about it is that I don't think about it. Right. It I'm works. the same way. Yeah. It just works for me. And um, you plug in drives and then you put pictures on there and that's it. Now, the other day, you'll see this is this is um, this is Drobo's interface that communicates with their drive. And you see I've got two three terabyte drives, a four terabyte drive and two eight terabyte drives. This may not be optimal, but again, it doesn't matter. It just works. Right. The reason yeah. I have two eight terabyte drives is because I actually had. So the other day I had a, a blinking light come on here and it said, warning, this drive is is dying. It, it's failing. It turned red. And um and I actually had an empty bay down here. So I popped out the other four terabyte drive I had and found a inexpensive drive on uh, Amazon and bought two eight terabyte drives and put them in there. And everything was fine. I mean, I completely removed a drive that had pictures on it. But all of those pictures were backed up on the other three drives. So it didn't matter. And now... Um, when I pop in the new drives, it just automatically repopulates and, and fills in the, the blanks. And now I've got even more space. So, yeah. And I, I see from the dashboard that you've got, you've only used 30% of your space there. That's the three yeah. dots on the bottom. Right. Yeah. No, that's great. And right one word of caution, you only replace one drive at a time. Yes, that's true. I put in one new drive and then, uh, once that one had, had finished saying it was, it was, populating that drive then i popped in the other one so uh are you you're getting i think you've ordered one of the new 5d3s that and that's going to become your primary drobo what are you going to use the 5d for anything yeah so i'll probably use it as a backup for the other dro for the for the new one the new one's just a little bit faster a little bit faster communicating between well it's a lot uh, faster because it's right. thunderbolt three yeah so that that's the advantage i'll get out of it which is going to be good for i'm doing more and more video work and I've got to have my video files on the Drobo because they're they're safe, you know. Right. I'm not going to lose them all in one fell swoop. So you're going to love the 5D3 because I can edit. Actually, this uh, this webinar will be edited in Premiere running off of my Drobo. I don't have Perfect. to have a faster drive because the Drobo's plenty fast enough. So yeah. it's it's a really good thing. What's the next picture that you have for? Oh. Uh, drobostore.com mm. and if you mention photo focus p h o t o f o c u s there is a 10% discount on any of the drobo products so excellent i think people should go take a look at drobostore.com so what's our next picture levi oh this one's a lot of fun oh it is again this is the kind of thing you could do with a flashlight <laughs> Although this is this is this uses a flash, it's best to do this with a flash. And you can use an inexpensive newer flash from Amazon, or you can use the the on-brand flash. The flash is on the right, and it is the the key to this picture is that the camera is set to fire the flash after the picture has exposed. Um, it's second curtain sync, right? Rear curtain sync. Now and for so, Canon users. Oh, man, let's not talk oh, about Oh, we it. have to because there are people who use <laughs> Canons. For Canon users, the only way you can do rear curtain sync is to use a Canon brand flash. Right. Even the pro cameras like you see over my shoulder, they have no rear curtain sync setting at all. 
and yes, I've had yes. huge discussions yes. with Canon about this, and yeah. they say use our flash, and I'm going, I want to sync it with my big boy <laughs> studio strobes, and they're going, well, you just put a slate, and it's just, it's lame. Anyway, yes, that's my right. editorial. So, Back to your picture. Yeah, a good a good hack for uh, Canon users would be to use an extension cord on the flash that that takes the you just have a cord going from the flash to your camera and that um gives you the ability to do right they, to do canon cords. actually makes one that extends their automatic branded flashes so exactly yeah that's exactly. a workaround but and and anyway it's lame i just it gotta is. say it's lame <laughs> <laughs> so is. back to this great picture so this is called second curtain the, the, the can you flip back to me for a second Kevin? sure absolutely okay, your camera your camera has has a curtain that covers the sensor, and it goes like this. It opens, and then it closes, and then it resets, and it opens, and it closes every time you take a picture. Normally, you want this thing to be all the way open when the flash goes off so that the whole picture is illuminated by the flash. Right. Um, so open the shutter. Yeah. I'll be the flash. So it, flash. Yeah, flash. That's first curtain. And then the curtain closes. Right. If you if you've ever had a problem where where you have like a black bar across your picture after the flash goes off, that's because shutter speed's too fast. The flash, yeah, your shutter speed's too fast, and the second curtain was already closing when the flash went off. Correct. And so right there's on, a portion yeah. of the sensor that that wasn't uh, exposed. Now what we're doing here is we're opening the 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 shutter, so the ambient light can come in and the subject can move. Exactly, and this is a long exposure because he's moving. In fact, let's see, it's uh, two seconds, this picture. So he so starts moving two seconds yeah. and gets into the final position that's lit by the flash, right. and then that second curtain starts to close, and that's when the flash fires. Yeah. Is that so right? It opens. Yeah, it opens. It's open for two seconds, and then the flash goes, and then this closes. And so wherever he is at that end of that two seconds he's illuminated by the flash at that point whereas over here we've got this uh this black light is is what's illuminating him from the from the side over there during that two seconds and he can use any flashlight you can use a colored light you can have a lot of fun with this long exposure second curtain portrait and uh it's it's really enjoyable to do well you can now, also use some of these new leds where you can dial the color in like the exactly. one i'm using on the background here in my shot yeah so yeah I, I, oh my loom cubes are, are in my bag because i was shooting with them yesterday but loom cubes are a great way to go with this right and the loom cube is a great little device i happen to have one right here this is the loom cube air mm -hmm. and they're they're super when you need just some extra light you just turn them on and there you go I can be yeah. Frankenstein, scary. <laughs> <laughs> Very scary. <laughs> well, Halloween's so. coming. Come on. It's October. <laughs> We're 30 days away. Well, 30 and a half, right? <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Yeah, here we go. All right. So right what's up. our next image? Oh, this is a favorite from last year. Ooh, I love this. Um. This is yeah. such a quintessential Idaho photograph. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, that brings back memories of being a little kid there. Yeah, yeah. The early morning light in the woods is just... Yeah, and the rifle or the shotgun when you're out duck or right. pheasant hunting. Yep. Uh, and so we were out, and, and she was looking for bears, and I was making pictures of her. And uh, the key to this picture is that it's shot with a really, really long lens. So I'm, I'm racked out to 200 millimeters... Oh, 213 millimeters on my micro four thirds camera. That makes it like 430 millimeters. It's that kind point. of an angle of view for sure. It's a crop 213. Yeah. So it's, it's that long lens and a it's wide gorgeous. aperture. And it just, it, you can, you can get that blown out bouquet in the background using a very big aperture, but this is at like 5.3 or 6.3, I think. What's it say? Oh, 5.1, because that's the maximum this lens does at that focal length. Um, well, that, that background know, is nowhere close to her. It's quite a ways away. Right. You're and talking so, big sky mountain country. Right. We, we don't have to have an f1.2 lens to do this. 
you can do this with a 70 to 300 that costs you under 200 bucks. And it's because you're, you're using a long lens and the background is far, far behind her. So I'm, I'm standing, you know, 50 yards away. She doesn't know I'm making pictures at this point. Right. Right. And I think it's important right now that, uh, for people that are watching that are gunniverse, uh, when we go out hunting, we actually take the game that we kill and we take it home and we eat it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, we're, this is not for sport or for trophies. It's actually to put uh, food on the table. And yeah, in, uh, I've in had America, some of your, trophies. I've had some of your game and it's really good. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. What's yeah. next? Let's see. Oh, Kinsey. This, this was a, an experiment also on, on uh, this was shot on Portra with that six by seven. It's a 45 millimeter lens on a medium format. It's like, so a, it's a wide like angle a, lens. Yeah. It's a very wide angle lens. Um, and with wide angle lenses, you just, you need to be careful about a few things when you make a portrait like your phone, for instance, phones are great tools because they have a camera right there. Right. I've got a iPhone six, six S plus or something or other. So you've got the two not, lenses. I've got the one lens. So that's, oh, okay. that's, that's what I want to point out is I've got just the one lens, which is kind of like about a 28 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. Right. And, it's actually a normal lens for that camera. Oh, good. Yeah. But it's very wide. It is and, very wide. Yeah. There's a, and so when you tilt that wide lens, you, you get these converging, um, converging lines and you get, you also get a lot of foreshortening and foreshortening means things that are closer to the camera appear much larger than things that are farther away which is normal. You know, if I hold my hand out in front of, you know, ho hold my hand out close to you, it looks bigger than my face. When yeah. I act next to my face. Go ahead face, and do that again. Normal. Sure. So there's, there's my hand looking huge because the, the lens on my computer right here is also very wide, but truly my hand is, is, you know, the same size as my face, not three times right. larger. Well, this brings up another point, Levi. Uh, one of the people on your Facebook page wants to know some tips for shooting selfies. Oh, yeah. And I think yeah. we're right in, in that kind of area right now. We are. And so you see people love to do seatbelt selfies, right, where they're sitting in their car and they hold their, their camera up in front of them like this. And the reason that looks good is because they've got this big windshield, which is given a soft light shining in on them. And they're also holding their camera up here um, with a wide angle lens, which diminishes the size of the rest of their body and makes their eyes look nice and large. Is that why uh -oh. James Corden always looks so good in carpool karaoke? <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> um, so when you, when you do portraits of people with a wide lens, you should pay attention to how close they are to the camera. If I, if I bring that, that lens close to my face, my nose is a little bit closer to the camera than the rest of my face, and it's going to look very big. Um, here, Kinsey's left foot looks much larger than her right foot because it's closer to the camera. And, um, and so that, that foreshortening can be a benefit, but it can also make your hips look huge or right. your nose and your forehead look, I, I, that's, baby pictures done with a 50 millimeter lens on a full frame picture. The half the frame is forehead, man. Right. Well, <laughs> one of the reasons, you know, whenever we see a celebrity doing a selfie, have you ever noticed how the picture is done with the camera way up? Yeah. Yeah. They always like out here up, you know? and they're looking up. Well, yeah. it stretches the neck and makes them look, yeah. look thinner. So that's right. why they're putting that camera up. Cause they're very well, of, very well aware of camera angles. Right. Absolutely. Um, what so, other tips for selfies? Yeah. Look for, a, look for a nice, big, soft, flat light. That's not going to be contrasty on you. And then, uh, don't worry about how you look when you do a selfie, worry about who you're with. Right. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, now yeah. somebody and else was sideways. asking, huh? Go ahead. <laughs> and, and shoot it sideways. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot a well, horizontal photo. Right. Right. Hold it. Well, we don't want to get into videos and the fact that, that uh, screens and movie theaters go this way, not yeah. this way. Right. But we're not going to mention that today. So the, one of the questions that's come up is how do you get 
little girls to be engaged in your portraits. And I think you have some to show us, I, don't you? I do. I do. Oh, here we go. Isn't she a cutie? She is a cutie. Um, <laughs> the, the key thing is, is play. You just, you talk to kids and you let them play and you say something ridiculous. And that's when you get this look and, uh, and you just keep shooting. I mean, film is free now. So yeah, it really is. Lots of pictures. Yeah. Um, also, I think there was a question in there about focal lengths. And yes, there was actually, we, I was getting to that, but this now's a good time. Yeah, we talked about about a wide lens being difficult to to make a flattering picture on a on a camera on a on a phone in particular. But if you use a telephoto lens, use an eighty five millimeter, use a, a hundred millimeter. Man, when I shot Nikon, I didn't take the one hundred and five millimeter micro off my lens off my camera for a year and a half. When I was I shooting Nikon people. back in the days of film, I didn't either. I mean, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And One so, of the things I'm jonesing for right now is the 105 f1.4 Sigma lens. I right. can hardly wait. I've seen it. It's yeah. it's massive, but what a great focal length. I wish I could just get a little more love from those guys on some on some uh, uh, micro four thirds lenses. Actually, I shoot all my all my headshots. I use a Sigma 60 millimeter, which on on my micro four thirds. I have one on my Sony NEX7, and it's beautiful. Yeah, it's even longer on mine, and so. Um, using a long lens does a few things for you. It gives you that, that more out of focus background. It also reduces the size of the background. So this is a 75 millimeter lens on my, on my Panasonic. Um, it'd be a 150 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. Right. So it and, really has got that crop factor and it compresses everything. Yeah. It, Do you it have an example everything? or how about that person sitting in the twin doors? I do. Would that be a good uh, one to, that's a good one real quick on this one. Oh, yeah. The great thing about the telephoto lens here is that it doesn't show the rest of the room. We're just in the living room here, and we don't see the pictures hanging on the walls. We don't see the coffee table with books all over it. All we see is is this kid. And I'm not right up in her face to fill the frame. If I was shooting with a 50-millimeter lens, I'd have to be two feet away from her. Here, right, you could I'm almost reach out and tweak her on the nose. Yeah. Here I'm sitting across the room, which gives people space and allows them – you know, space to, to be more comfortable and be themselves. Well, so. nobody's comfortable with a big piece of equipment looking like a close talker. Right. Right. This it's is a just, marvelous portrait and it's, it, it shows that it's the composition really uh, factors in too. It does. Thank you. Um, I spent, I, I, I got excited when I saw it and I'm really glad it, it turned out. Well, we were walking around the city um, doing some senior pictures with CC and uh, and this is this is at night. It's totally dark outside, but there was a light on over this door, and there's another security light off to this. There's like a a truck door to the left here, like a, a bay door where a truck can pull up. So there's another light over there. There's nothing illuminating the steps. So I used the soft box with a speed light um, set at about her eye level. So it's all the way down on the stand, setting down, shining across at her. And then I, I took a little time. The, the thing to do when you make a, um, a picture where you are using the light that's already there is to make that picture first. So turn off the light. Turn off the speed light. Just use the light that's already there and get that looking great. So this right. is a 13th of a second. Okay, so that's for the background. That's for the background. That's for the, the ambient light. And so at that you know, that first shot, her face is dark. She's lit by the street lamps behind me, which are orange. And, and these are green fluorescents and everything looks, looks terrible. But, um, but I've got that light for the background looking correct. Now, when I add the flash, I only adjust the power of the flash. I don't need to adjust my camera settings. So choose the aperture you want to use for creative reasons. Here I'm at f1.2 because I want a little more focus on her. Um, and the, the background to be just a little bit softer. Now, it's not going to be super out of focus soft because I'm standing away from her. She's closer to the background than she is to me, so there's just more depth of field there. Um, also, that's good because I want to see what the place is. Yeah. She's a little sharper, but not you know crazy out of focus background. And so you're on a tripod here, right? 
I'm definitely on a tripod. Yeah, I'm a and, big fan of tripods, and most people fight me tooth and toenail about no. working on tripods. And yeah. like I said, you can see one over my shoulder. I was yep. shooting all day yesterday, and I never handheld anything. No. Um, I mean, why would you? It, I can't it think of a reason. you from your clients, and it limits your abilities. Right. I couldn't shoot this at, at a thirteenth of a second, and I certainly couldn't shoot it at a thirteenth of a second and keep everything square. Right. You know, this is a very square picture. I need everything to be lined up just right. I need the I need the camera perfectly horizontal in in two axes and everything's got to be be just right. And the so composition works so incredibly well. If you didn't have a tripod, you'd never be able to get that photograph. Exactly. Now I can just work with her because the light is set, the camera is set. Right. So you've locked down the variable of you've locked down the variable of composition using the tripod. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. And so she can move, she can change, and the focus point just stays on her. And that's that's the only the only difference. So choose your aperture for creative reasons. Right. Set your set your ambient exposure, whether that's making it completely black so it looks like a studio, or if you're balancing the light, and then turn on your flash and make it look great on your subject. And so in this case, I also use the gel on the flash to match the the lights in the uh on the building there, add a little green to it. So what that did for you was it, uh, it made you, when you white balance the whole image, you brought the whole thing back because it all was under the same colors. Exactly. Great. Exactly. What's and next? Also, uh, real quick on this one. Sure. <laughs> uh, a, a tip I learned from Tony Corbell is that you, you don't need the soft box to illuminate the floor here. So I've, I've actually tilted the soft box upward so that it's not shining on the ground as much so I don't get this hot spot down there. Right. You, you can see, see the thing? shadow in the foreground right down the lower right-hand corner as we look at it. Yes. But, and if I had, had, if I had put the soft, soft box pointing directly at it, like perfectly vertical, this would be really hot down here in the, in the bottom left corner right. because it's so much closer to the light. So instead, I've tilted the box upward. It's still effectively shining on her the same but it's reduced that brightness in the foreground. Right. Okay, we're almost out of time, but I want, oh, yeah, done. we got to see this. This is amazing. Okay. You know, <laughs> and one. somebody was <laughs> asking, how do you get the expressions? You, you just play, you know, you, you take a bull whip with you to the park and you whip it around a tree limb and let the kid hang on it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, somebody said when you're taking pictures of kids, or, or, or people, how long do you keep them engaged with the camera before you have them take a break? There, there's no break here, right? This is playing. There's nothing to take a break from. If I if I stop and say smile. Oh, yeah, that's a big sin. Right? It's gone. Um, the, the key is that the play is continuous. The, the play keeps going. Look at look at my niece here. Yeah. The, the play is the picture. Right. And. Yeah, there's not one where she's standing looking at me with a Pan Am smile, and that's good. So, so Shakespeare, Shakespeare actually had it all figured out for portraiture when he wrote the plays the thing. The plays the thing. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. The play the thing. So. That's awesome. Look, you have good. a you have a picture that we led off with, and I'd love to have you chat about that before we close out. This is uh this is Patch Peterson. He he used to run the the Woodwright shop at um, this historical farm in Cache Valley, Utah, in Logan, Utah. And uh, so his, his job here was he'd make these spoons handmade with chisels and, and gouges and then sell them as souvenirs. And uh, we were, we were, I took my whole photo club to the, to the farm that day and we were all making pictures everywhere. And I saw a patch in there and I, I started I was reading Joe McNally books at the time. And so I was, I was feeling really Joe McNally ish and uh, <laughs> love the way this one turned out. Same thing. I'm balancing with the light that's already in the room. The lights coming from this, uh, this, the shop light in the back, right? The that practical, there. the practical light. And then I also have, there's two windows to the right of him here, but they're not large and they're just not enough to make this picture look great. And they're they're kind of north facing, and this is a tungsten light bulb over here. It's very orange. The light coming in these windows is coming from the blue sky, not from direct sunlight. So it's very very blue, 
and those those can be a great contrast but that's not what I wanted in this picture I wanted it all to look uh, a bit more homogeneous so I'm using that five in one reflector and I took the cover off so it's just the the sheer white fabric inside and I've got a speed light shining through that in the place where the windows are so that it feels like that window light coming in but I've also added a gel a warming gel as a CTO gel to that light so that it matches the light in the background here and um, and then I just said hey patch lean on this counter and look over here and uh no, with your good eye, you know, throw, <laughs> throw something at it, folks, and uh, and it ends up it ends up being a pretty good picture. Now, the the key to doing this too is that I got this all set up while Patch was dealing with some other customers. He was selling spoons. I'm over here. I've balanced the light. I've got the speed light already set up. I asked somebody else to stand in that spot while I set the speed light. Now, Patch, when he's done working with that customer. I say, hey, Patch, can I have you for 10 seconds? And it really only takes 10 seconds for him to stand right there. Everything else is already set up and um, take a picture. Wow, that's awesome. Levi, I want to thank you so much for working with us today on this webinar for Drobo and Photo Focus. Your photographs are amazing. Your stories are just as great. And uh, I know our audience is uh, uh, a lot richer for having had you on today. So thank you very oh, much nice. for coming all the way from Nampa yeah. and joining us on this Drobo Photo Focus webinar on portraiture. Do you have a final word? No, oh, just go out there, make pictures, but more importantly, make stories. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Levi. I'm Kevin Ames for Photo Focus and Drobo. We'll see you next time when we do another Drobo Photo Focus webinar. Until then, keep shooting.